Lakaya Chakshurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaivacha Patitanam Pavan Hebyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasade Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our study of Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti Vai Bhav. And we're looking at Canto 2 and today we're going on to chapter number 3. All right. Okay, so, okay. Thank you, Pooh. So, chapter number three, pure devotional service, the change in the heart. Is everyone seeing the PowerPoint? Are we okay? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. Okay, so chapter number three begins with... <laughs> Demigod worship. We're going to hear about demigod worship because uh, in the previous chapter we were hearing, well, first of all, remember chapter one, we heard about we could worship the Lord through the universal form by the philosophy of pantheism. We could see the Lord in everything in the world. And in this way, we could hear and chant the glories of the Lord. And then chapter number two went on to describe that we could also worship the Lord in the heart as the super soul within the heart of all living entities and within our own heart. But it was mentioned that if you want to actually get f success from that worship, we should be without material desires. So chapter three begins talking about what happens for people who have material desires. So people who have material desires, people who have material desires, the Vedas recommend that we can worship demigods. It's not that Sukadeva Goswami is recommending that we should worship demigods, but he's pointing out that in the Vedas, demigod worship is there. So we'll hear about that. And then verses 9 to 12, we'll describe worshipping Krishna, the ultimate path. Now this is recommended by Sukadeva Goswami. Sukadeva Goswami is going to recommend that this is the actual path which we want to follow, we want to worship Krishna. Even though you may have material desires, still you can worship Krishna. And then the final section of the chapter we'll hear about Sonaka Rishi's eagerness to hear Krishna Kata. And uh, it's divided up, first of all, 13 to 16, Sonaka Rishi's inquiries. And then Sonaka Rishi criticizes those who do not hear Krishna Kata. It's very wonderful how Sonaka Rishi preaches very strongly against those people who have no interest in hearing Krishna Kata. So we'll look at those verses and then we'll hear at the end of the chapter, Shonaka Rishi condemns the limbs and other bodily parts of those who do not serve Krishna. So it's a very nice chapter. It's not a very long chapter, but it's very powerful, very powerful preaching the second half of the chapter from Shona Karishi. 
Okay, so connection with chapter 2. Sukadeva Goswami concludes his answer to Parikshit Maharaj regarding the duty of a man about to die. A thoughtful person should hear Krishna Kata. Right? This has been the answer Sukadeva Goswami has given to Maharaj Parikshit that you have to hear, chant, and remember the topics of the Lord. This is the duty of one who's about to die and the duty of all men at all times. So, the point comes up, what about someone who has material desires? Whom should that person worship to fulfill those desires? All right, we heard if you have material desires and can't worship the super soul, and if you still have sex desire, you shouldn't go, be shouldn't go beyond the first two cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, you should worship the Virata Rup. If you're absorbed in material desires, contemplate the Virata Rup. But here, a, a different approach is given that how can we fulfill these material desires? What if someone has strong material desires, how can they go about fulfilling the, these desires? So, as a prelude to his answer, Sukadeva Goswami starts listing the personalities one may worship in order to fulfill one's material desires. And there's a big list of different demigods who are recommended for fulfilling different material desires. So here's the first verse. Sukadeva Goswami said, Maharaj Parikshit, as you have inquired from me as to the duty of the intelligent man who is on the threshold of death, so I have answered you. All right, so can someone read now the next verse? We need somebody to read up to text number nine. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, can I read? Yes, please, Maharaji. Uh, fulfilling all desires, 1 to 12, Sri Shukha Uvacha, Evam Etan Nigaditam, Prishtavan Yad Bhavan Mama, Dranam Yad Brahmanan, Ma Nanam, Manusheshu Manishinam. Sri Shukadev Goswami said, Maharaj Parikshit, as you have inquired from me as to the duty of the intelligent man who is on the threshold of death, so I have answered you. Read till verse 9. Yeah, keep reading. Have you got a book? Um, yeah, yeah, uh, I'll, just, I'll just open it. Chapter 3. Two, 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 text 2 to 7, uh, Maharaj. Okay. Uh, one, one who desires to be absorbed in the impersonal Brahma Jyoti fulgence should worship the master of the Vedas, Lord Brahma or Brihaspati, the learned priest. One who desires powerful sex should worship the heavenly king. And one who desires good progeny should worship the great progenitors called the Prajapatis. One who desires good fortune should worship Durga Devi, the superintendent, the superintendent of the material world. One desiring to be very powerful should worship fire. And one who aspires only after money should worship the Vasus. One should worship the Rudra incarnations of Lord Shiva if he wants to be a great hero. One who wants a large stock of grains should worship Aditi. One who desires to attain the heavenly planets should worship the sons of Aditi. One who desires 
a worldly kingdom should worship Vishwadev and one who wants to be popular with the general mass of population should worship the Sadhya demigod. One who desires a long span of life should worship the demigods known as Ashwini Kumaras. And a person desiring a strongly built body should worship the earth. One who desires stability in his post should worship the horizon and earth combined. One who desires to be beautiful should worship the beautiful residents of the Gandharva planet. And one who desires a good wife should worship the Apsaras, Apsaras and the Urvashi society girls of the heavenly kingdom. One who desires domination over others should worship Lord Brahma, the head of the universe. One who desires tangible fame should worship the personality of Godhead. And one who desires a good bank balance should worship the demigod Varuna. If one desires to be a greatly learned man, he should worship Lord Shiva. And if one desires a good marital relation, he should worship the chaste goddess Uma, the wife of Lord Shiva. Text 8. Yes, go ahead. One should worship Lord Vishnu or his devotee for spiritual advancement in knowledge and for protection of heredity and advancement of a dynasty. One should worship the various demigods. Text 9. One who desires domination over a kingdom or an empire should worship the Manus. One who desires victory over an enemy should worship the demons. And one who desires sense gratification should worship the moon. But one who desires nothing of material enjoyment should worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Text 10. No, a person... it's okay. 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 Text 10, we Hi. have it here. Yes. Okay. So, Akama Sarvakamo Va Moksha Kama Udaridi Tivrena Bhakti Yogena Yajeta Purushamparam. A person who has broader intelligence, whether he be full of all material desire, without any material desire, or desiring liberation, must by all means worship the Supreme Whole the personality of Godhead. So we heard Sukadeva Goswami give a long list of different demigods which were all recommended in the Vedas. But now he's, he wasn't recommending any of those demigods. But now you can see he mentions here a person who has broader intelligence, right? So that's important, the Udharadi. Uh, the person who has a broader intelligence, then he will worship the personality of Godhead, the Supreme Whole. This is uh, the point. Even though we have material desires, mentioned may, may be full of material desires, sava kama, moksha kama, and bhakti yogena. It doesn't matter what you want. You have all material desires, no material desires, or you want moksha kama, desire for liberation. But if you're actually intelligent, we have to worship the Lord. Now what will happen if we have all material desires and we worship the Lord? What will be the result? Anybody can say? Yes? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaji. Uh, uh, if a person worships the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even though he has material desires, then the Lord will not only fulfill those desires, but uh, that soul would be um, ultimately attracted to devotional service of the Lord. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I don't quite agree with you that the Lord is going to fulfill all of our material desires. That may not happen. I don't think you're quite correct there to say like that. The Lord will consider, first of all, 
of if these material desires are actually necessary or not. And he may, in the, in the course of worshipping the Lord, the result of worshipping the Lord is we will become purified. And the, as we become purified, then these material desires will be purified also. They will be forgotten about. So that's also possible. It's not, that, it's not that in every case the Lord will fulfill all of our desires. He knows, the Lord knows these material desires are really not necessary. They're not the goal of life. And the Lord can purify the heart of the devotee and take away these desires. And so when we are actually, when we have that broader intelligence, we will come to worship the Lord and we will take up the worship of the Lord no matter what is our position, what is our desires, but we will come to the Lord. And tivrena bhakti yogena, tivrena, meaning the full, the full rays of devotion, just like tivra, tivra means that the ray of light which comes from the sun. So that ray of bhakti, that ray of devotion, that will connect us to the supreme whole, to the personality of Godhead and allow us to develop a real spiritual nature through bhakti yoga. So we should understand the, the implications of this uh, uh, broader intelligence, what it means to, be, to have broader intelligence. It means we will come to worship the, the Lord. <clears throat> and uh, there's a nice example given uh, by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and he describes that, uh, he said, you know, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, of, of letters, I am the letter A, right? Of letters, I am the letter A. So, here you have Kama, Sarva Kama, Moksha Kama. But when you put an A in front of the Kama, then it becomes actually service to Krishna. So, if we want to change from kama to akama, you just simply have to, the only way in which you can actually effectively get rid of material desires is by service to Krishna. And so when you put that A in front of the kama, it becomes akama, it becomes service to Krishna. So that is the result of broader intelligence. Material desires become insignificant by purification of our existence, by engaging in Krishna's service, then all the material desires are washed away. Okay? How to develop Maharaj. that? Yes? Someone had a question? Maharaj. Yeah, Maharaj Ji, please accept my humble obeisances. I wanted to check um, also in connection with what we discussed in the second chapter because I was just thinking yesterday um, and now we are talking about material desire. So what I want to ask you is that as we read in 2.4 also that how we should, uh, you know, keep minimum desire. I mean, you know, like where Prabhupada says that, you know, uh, mentioned in the shloka that you don't even need a pillow, you can just use your... Um, so we minimize our desires. So Prabhupada says human life is meant for self-realization. That's the point over there. But is this also a material desire when we as practicing devotees would like to, you know, uh, we first take a small apartment, then we like to shift to a bigger place. We like to shift to a villa. So we do that for Krishna and to serve Krishna's devotees. But somewhere down the line, I feel that maybe I also want to enjoy that big apartment, big house, big villa. So will that be considered as a material desire for practicing devotees? Well, it's a question of how you use that big villa. If you're yes. actually genuine, gen, if your genuine desire is to use it for Krishna, and you know, you, you're going to have regularly ongoing programs there with devotees, then okay, it's, it's, it's good, no problem. But if it's just for your comfortable living, then it's material. But if you're actually genuinely thinking that you want to use it for the service of Krishna, 
then it's spiritual. Okay, Maharaj, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, it, it's a fine line. It's a fine line to know what is actually for our sense gratification and what is for Krishna. You know, sometimes devotee may buy a, a new car and they get a very nice car and they say, oh yes, I, I got this car for the service of my Guru Maharaj. Of course, Guru Maharaj comes maybe two days in a year or something, you know. You're not going to use it very often in his service. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, we say like that. And so, <clears throat> similarly with the apartment. The apartment, it shouldn't just be two days a year. It should be regular. Regularly, you should have programs going on. And you should be very happy to accommodate devotees also sometimes. Devotees need some place to stay. You should have, you know, try to keep your house open that you can, you're willing to have devotees come there. You know, do what you can to utilize it for the service of Krishna and Krishna's devotees. So that's the, the main point. <laughs> that's, that's, that's spiritual. And you get a lot of mercy that way, you do. You get a lot of mercy, you get a lot of association, you make advancement. Okay, so, oh sorry, what happened? How to develop broader intelligence, text number 11. All the different kinds of worshippers of multi-demigods can attain the highest perfectional benediction, which is spontaneous attraction unflinchingly fixed upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead only by the association of the pure devotees of the Lord. So we want to develop that broader intelligence. We have to develop, we have to take advantage the association of devotees, the pure devotees of the Lord. And that will bring us to that kind of, uh, that spontaneous attraction fixed upon the Personality of Godhead, that broader intelligence. We achieve that broader intelligence by the mercy of the devotees, you get the blessings of the devotees. Right? We say, Mahat Sevam Dwara Mahur Vimuktis. By serving the Mahatmas, the devotees, it opens the doors to liberation. So you want, we want to develop that broader intelligence, we have to take advantage of the association of the devotees and that will bring us to that point that we can appreciate more the Personality of Godhead. So text number 11 is reminding us the importance of this. And the text number 12, Bhakti is beyond liberation. Transcendental knowledge in relation with the Supreme Lord Hari is knowledge resulting in the complete suspension of the waves and whirlpools of the material modes. Such knowledge is self-satisfying due to its being free from material attachment and being transcendental it is approved by authorities. Who could fail to be attracted? So in this way Sukadeva Goswami is speaking the glories of transcendental knowledge. And the result of that knowledge, you get free from the material modes. The knowledge is sat very satisfying. So. We develop that knowledge simply by engaging in devotional service. By doing devotional service, we automatically develop knowledge and detachment. So transcendental knowledge comes about in the course of our devotional service. Because in our devotional service, we're going to be hearing and chanting. We're going to be hearing and chanting, we're going to be uh, studying the scriptures and the association of devotees 
And this is going to give us that transcendental knowledge, which is going to take away all our attachments to the material energy. So very important for us to hear regularly, hearing, and not, not just hearing, but chanting also. Oh. Let's see. All right, so bhakti, devotional services, far beyond liberation. Liberation will take us out of the material world, but it, it's, we're not secure with liberation. Just simply come to the platform of Brahman. There has to be proper engagement. And the proper engagement on the platform of Brahman is devotional service which begins with hearing that was mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. Now the impersonalists, they may come to the platform of liberation, they simply stop. They think nothing to do now. They give up all activities. Their process is negation. They stop hearing. They, they, don't, do, they don't do any more chanting. They just simply sit, nothing. So they cannot maintain that position for long. So their liberation is only theoretical and they'll come back to the material world. This is a problem with impersonal liberation. Their position is not secure. And this is described also in Srimad Bhagavatam. All right? that they come back to the material world. And when they come back to the material world, then they take up some welfare activity, some mundane activity based more on the body. Because they're not properly situated in devotional service. And they think of devotional service as simply being the means to liberation. But we should understand devotional service is here in this world and in the spiritual world. In the spiritual world, after liberation, we will continue to serve Krishna. It's not something which we give up. It's something which we want to increase. We want to increase more and more our hearing and our chanting. All right? And now Sonakarishi's eagerness for Krishna Kata. You can see all the sages in Naimisharanya, they've all come. And Sutta Goswami is seated there, and Shonakarishi is the head of the sages. He's the senior most member there. He's the most senior, and he's the one to put the questions to Sutta Goswami. So Sonakarishi is going to speak for a, lot, a while here. Here's a quote from Srila Prabhupada. Someone like to read? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Similarly, Krishna's place, Goloka Vrindavana, that is also spread everywhere. How that Goloka Vrindavana became spread? As soon as there is a devotee. Yes. Tatra Tishtam, Tishtam Narada Yatra Gayanti Mad Bhaktaha. Krishna says, Naham Tishtami, Vaikunta. Nacha yogi nam I do not stay in Vaikuntha Loka or within the heart of the yogis. Tatra tishtan, tishtami narada yatra gayanti mad bhaktaha. I stay there where my devotees are chanting about me, about my glories. This is the process. Immediately, Goloka eva nivashakya akilatma bhutaha, Brahma Samhita 5.37. That is Krishna's power. Omnipotency. Omnipotence, Bombay, September 1973. Mm -hmm. So Prabhupada is making the point that Krishna is not just in Goloka Vrindavan, or he said that Goloka Vrindavan becomes spread. <coughs> <coughs> and Prabhupada quotes this verse, which he often said, that said, I am not in the hearts of the yogis meditating on me, and I am not in Vaikuntha. But 
I am wherever my devotee, like Narada, is chanting my glories. So, in this way, Lord Krishna is glorifying the chanting of the holy name. And, of course, he's also glorifying his devotee, Narada. But both, both the devotee and the holy name. The devotee's business is to chant the holy name. And Lord Krishna is very attracted to that. And Lord Krishna says here, Prabhupada quotes, that he is wherever the devotee is chanting his holy name. It attracts Krishna. So then, uh, the chapter goes on to speak about uh, Maharaj Parikshit and about how, well, is it Maharaj Parikshit? He's speaking about uh, how young people, young children worship the deities. Uh, I have to open my text. Huh? Anyway, the discussion is based on na, nitya siddha and sadhana siddhas. The, we have to understand the difference here between the nitya siddha and the sadhana siddha. We have the example about some devotees, great devotees, from their very childhood, they're worshipping the deity. Yes, Sonakarishi was speaking to Sutta Goswami that he wants to hear more about Lord Hari, who certainly should be glorified in the association of devotees. The business of devotees when they come together is to hear and chant. So they speak about Maharaj Parikshit, how he was worshipping, playing with dolls even as a child. So Prabhupada mentions that this is the sign of a, of a Nitya Siddha, a great devotee, because even as a child he's worshipping the doll and even when he's called for food he doesn't like to go because he's so absorbed in worshipping and playing with his, the doll of Krishna. And of course we saw that also with Prabhupada and uh, we see it also with uh, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati as a young child, how he was so renounced that when his father told him, oh you've eaten mango before it was offered, this is an offence, then he said, oh then I will not take mango anymore. And throughout his life he didn't take mangoes. So like that, you can see uh, great devotees from their very childhood, how they're very, very de devoted. So, in the purport there, text 15, Prabhupada is discussing about the Mahabhagwats. He said, such Mahabhagwats are called Nitya Siddhas, or souls liberated from birth. But there are also others who may not be liberated from birth, but who develop a tendency for devotional service by association, and they are called sadhana siddhas. There is no difference between the two in the ultimate issue, and so the conclusion is that everyone can become a sadhana siddha, a devotee of the Lord simply by association with the pure devotees. All right, we were talking about the importance of association with pure devotees to get transcendental knowledge. So here also Prabhupada is making the point that we can all become uh, Nitya Siddhas, well, we can become Sadhana Siddha, perfect by Sadhana, 
There's, there's actually different ways of achieving perfection here. Sadhana Siddha is mentioned, and by spiritual practice we can become pure devotees. There's also Kripa Siddha. One can become perfect by mercy. Of course, that's very rare to get Kripa Siddha. A devotee asked, what does it mean Kripa Siddha? And Prabhupada said, just like somebody comes and says, here's one million dollars. Somebody you never saw before comes and they want to give you one million dollars. Did it ever happen? Not very common. And so the same way, Kripa Siddha. And sometimes Prabhupada would talk about the, the honorary degree. The honorary degree. You never went to university, but the university honours calls you. They want to give you degree. Just like uh, Rabindranath Tagore, he was honoured by Oxford University they, because he had been writing books, poetry, and it was appreciated by the Oxford University. And so they called him to England and they honoured him. They gave him an honorary degree. So it's very rare. You know, I don't think any of us got honor, were given honorary degrees. We all had to go to college, we had to study, we had to take exams, pay fees and everything. But the person who gets honorary degree doesn't pay anything. So that's Kripa Siddha, special mercy. Very, very rare. Sadhana Siddha is more common, that you do spiritual practice regularly we do our sadhana and we develop a tendency for devotional service by association of course to do sadhana properly we have to regularly take association with pure devotees so Prabhupada said everyone can become sadhana siddha to become Nijas, we can't, we're not nijas in us, but we can become sadhana in us. So nijas siddha means he does not get covered by the influence of material nature about his natural devotional tendency to serve Krishna. He never becomes covered. This is difference. Krishna gives him chance to get birth in such a family. Just like Parikshit Maharaj, that he never gets the chance of forgetting Krishna. So one who does not get the chance of forgetting Krishna is called Nitya Siddha. That is the difference. And Sadhana Siddha means one has forgotten Krishna. Prabhupada's lecture on this verse in Los Angeles, 1972, third chapter, 15th verse. So, Nitya Siddha, he never forgets Krishna. And Sadhana Siddha, we can forget. We get the chance of forgetting Krishna. Or Prabhupada says, Sadhana Siddha means one has forgotten Krishna. We've forgotten Krishna, we're trying to remember Krishna. So we do sadhana and gradually we remember. Some more on this topic. A child naturally wants to play, so he can play with Krishna deity. We had the opportunity, Prabhupada's writing, we had the opportunity of doing that. My father was worshipping Krishna deity, so I wanted to imitate him, and he gave me small deity. That deity is still worshipped. My sister and myself, whatever we were eating, we were offering exactly the same archana. I'm not very sure where those deities are now. It may be that they're there in Calcutta Temple, in the Albert Road Temple. And I think they were there for some time. I don't know. But my understanding is that the, the deity which Prabhupada worshipped is there in the Calcutta Temple, in Albert Road. 
small Radha Krishna brass. So Prabhupada used to see his father worship the deity. Every night his father would come home from work and he was worshipping the deity. And so Prabhupada told us as a child he also wanted to do like his father. And so his father also gave him deity. And then sister Pishima, Prabhupada's sister, she was also a devotee. She was initiated. So together they would do the worship. And the father encouraged. So Prabhupada explains, this is the facility of taking birth in a Vaishnava family. Children, simply by playing with Krishna, they become Krishna conscious. Some way or other, if somebody comes in contact with Krishna, then his life becomes successful. So this Krishna yoga, bhakti yoga, can be practiced even by a child without interfering with his natural propensities. So Vaishnava families, they have that good fortune. Those of you who are born in the Vaishnava family, you'll be brought up to respect the deity, to worship the deity. Prabhupada continues here, the purport. And father used to encourage this Rati Atra and Radha Krishna temple which we are propagating. It was from the very beginning of our life, initiated by our parents. So anyone can imitate his, anyone can initiate his child to this Krishna consciousness understanding from the very beginning. So Prabhupada was very concerned with children born into the Krishna consciousness movement. He was always very concerned for the children <clears throat> and for their welfare. He gave a lot of instructions, different letters. You know, parents would write to Prabhupada asking about their children. And Prabhupada would give them advice and instructions how to bring their children up in Krishna consciousness. Because if from the very beginning of their childhood they have that opportunity to come to Krishna consciousness, means they're very special souls, they're very fortunate, and they have the opportunity to go on and become really great devotees. So they're described nitya siddha, nitya siddhas, because from the very beginning they're worshipping, and if they continue, they'll go on to become very great devotees, great preachers. Okay. Okay, so then the next verse, Sonakarishi is going to uh, attack those people who have no interest in hearing about Krishna consciousness. This is text number 17. Right? This is a, a famous verse, actually, an important verse, which we need to memorize, right? Ayur hariti vain pum sam mudyan astam chalyan asao tashyarte yachano nita utama shloka vartaya. Very nice verse, good for preaching, both by rising and by setting. The sun decreases the duration of life of everyone. Ayur, the duration of life, Hariti, decreases. Vaipumsa. So both by rising and setting, the sun decreases the duration of life of everyone, except one who utilizes the time by discussing topics of the all-good personality of Godhead. They're in Uttama Shloka, the all good personality of Godhead. So if we utilize our time, then we can protect ourselves.
we should understand how we benefit by discussing topics of Krishna. To keep our tongue always busy in discussing and chanting the glories of the Lord. And now it says, both by rising and setting of the sun. So someone may challenge that, uh, oh, does it mean you devotees, you don't die? So how will we respond to this? And someone will say, you know, you know, okay, the, you, you say you're chanting Hare Krishna and you're talking the topics of Krishna, so does your life not get reduced? Are you going to live forever? Are you immortal? How will we respond? Anyone? Shamalangam Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So uh, we can give them the answer that uh, Krishna himself would come as death to us. He would take us away with him to his abode. Yes. And then what will happen if we go to his abode? And then we live happily ever after. <laughs> we are, we become eternal. Right. Yes, right. That's the answer. Yes, we will get eternal life. That Yes, our life is reducing in this body, but because we're chanting the glories of the Lord, then we're going to go to be with the Lord. We're going to go to eternal life in the spiritual world. But what about those people who are not chanting the glories of the Lord? Where are they going to go? They never chant the glories of the Lord. They never discuss topics of Krishna. Where are they going to go? So they will be in the repeated cycle of birth and death. Right. Unarapi janya, unarapi yes. maranam. They're going to stay in the material world and suffer the results of their own karmic activities. Yes. So this is the power of the glories of the, chanting the glories of the Lord that we can overcome death by the process of Krishna Consciousness. Does someone like to read? Hare Krishna. Can I read them? Yes, go ahead. If you want to become immortal, Ayur Bharati Vaipum Sam Otyan Astam Chayan Nasal the sun is rising early in the morning. As it is rising, gradually it is taking your life. That's all. That is the business. But if you want to defeat the sun, sun is very powerful. It is very difficult to fight. But you can fight with the sun. How? Simply by reading Krishna Katha, the words of Krishna. Uttama Shloka Vart Vartaya. Vartaya, Uttama Shloka, Krishna. So this is the simple process. You don't waste your time by talking nonsense. <laughs> okay, so this is a warning. Don't waste your time by talking nonsense. And what is nonsense? Anything which is not in relation to Krishna Kta. If it's not in relation to Krishna, Krishna Consciousness, then it is just nonsense. It's just waste of time. This is Prabhupada actually, he's on the roof there of that one temple we had in Prabhupada's time. We occupied a building in Manhattan, in New York. And it was a, quite a big building, many floors. And Prabhupada's on the roof there. He enjoyed to sit there and devotees would come and discuss, hear topics from him. It's a very interesting picture. So we sold that building and we have another place now over back. We moved back to Brooklyn, but this was in Manhattan. All right. So someone please read next slide. 
Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. If you want to become immortal, so if we pass our time simply by reading and talking about Krishna, then the sun will, sun will not be able to take away our life. This is the secret. If you want to become immortal, then you always be engaged in Krishna Katha. Always 24 hours, always think of Krishna. This is Krishna Consciousness. June 12, 1972, Los Angeles. Thank you. Yes. So, we are encouraged always to be engaged in Krishna Katha. Try to bring everything into Krishna Consciousness. There's some nice examples of devotees who do that. There was this one, uh, there was this Vamsi Das Babaji who was in, uh, from the time of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, there was this Vamsi Das Babaji. And so if somebody would say to him, what do you think of the government? He would say, Govardhan, oh Govardhan, <laughs> you know, he wouldn't pick up on the word government, he would just say Govardhan. And you speak about Govardhan Hill, Govardhan, the people of Govardhan, the pastimes of Govardhan. Hmm. So this is Krishna consciousness. Even people come and they try to bring you to the mundane platform. You have to bring them up to the transcendental platform. People would come to Prabhupada and ask Prabhupada, how old are you Swamiji? And what would Prabhupada say to them? How would Prabhupada respond? Anyone? Yeah? Nobody? What do you think Prabhupada would say if they came and asked Prabhupada, how old are you, Swamiji? Nobody knows? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Pranam Pranam. Uh, I think Maharaj, I've heard that uh, Prabhupada, if somebody asked him, how old is you? How old are you? He once said, I'm the same age as you. Yes, right. That's the answer. Yes. Why did he say that? Because Maharaj, uh, we're all eternal and uh, eternal part and parcels of the Lord and we've come all at the same time. So, we're yeah. all in it, yeah. Yeah, yeah and by responding in this way, Prabhupada is able to bring the conversation up to this transcendental platform. If Prabhupada simply said, I'm 70-something or 80-something, you know, then it becomes mundane. But by Prabhupada responding on that way, in a, on a transcendental platform, then the, the whole conversation changes and Prabhupada can bring the person into Krishna consciousness. People are on the mundane platform. We have to bring them up to the higher platform. We have to see everything in relation to Krishna. And so this is, this is as devotees, we have to develop this art to always be thinking of Krishna and always talking of Krishna. We don't want to hear anything else but Krishna. And then Krishna's name, Krishna's teachings. So we have to learn how to use these things. All right, and then we'll go on to the next verse, and you can see something of <laughs> what we're coming to, right? The analysis of materialistic civilization. Okay, this is text number, uh, is it 18? Oh no, 18 is what? Well, 18, Sukadeva Goswami is speaking about 
He says, I'll read the translation text 18. Do the trees not live? Do the bellows of the blacksmith not breathe? All around us, do the beasts not eat and discharge semen? So Sukadeva Goswami is speaking like this. He's challenging the materialistic people who are not interested in Krishna consciousness. You know, they may, they, they're they so proud, uh, oh no, I'm living, I'm alive, I have my life, you know. Oh, but then Sukadeva Goswami, or Sonakarishi says, well, the trees also live. You're proud of living, you want to live. Oh, the trees live, the trees live longer than you. You're so proud of living, but the trees live even longer than you. And you, you say, well, I'm breathing, I'm better. Well, the bellows of the blacksmith, they also breathe. And what about, well, no, I also eat, you know, I don't just breathe, we also eat. Well, the beasts, they're also eating, and they're enjoying also discharging semen. And so, what's the difference between the animals and you? You're doing these things, you're so proud of your life, you're no different from the animals. We have to understand what is the responsibility of human life. So that is described that goes on text number 19, where uh, Shona Karishi speaks this quite well-known verse, all right, <laughs> about the the four kinds of animals. Svavid varahoshra karai samstuta purusha pashu nayat karna pata peto jatu nama gadagraja. Right? Men who are like hogs, dogs, camels and asses praise those men who never listen to the transcendental pastimes of Lord Sri Krishna, the deliverer from evil. So this is the analysis of the modern civilization. People don't have an interest to hear about Krishna. So they're compared in this way to these different creatures. You have the dogs and the hogs and the camel and the asses. So wh why are people compared to dogs? Someone can tell me? What's the analysis? Why does Shonaka Rishi compare people to dogs? Padma they accept the service of the greater master. They accept the service of a greater master. Mm, yeah, I, I think you could do a bit better than that. It's, you know, it's not just some a greater master, I mean, but... The, Guru Maharaj, can I say Guru Maharaj? Yes, please. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Dogs are faithful to its master, even for a small piece of uh, bread or biscuit, whatever they give. So they, they don't see what is actual required for their life. Just for a small piece, they are satisfied, they are behind them. So that is how common people who are non-devotees are compared with the dogs, Guru Maharaj. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah. You're glorifying the dogs in some way. <laughs> you, you, you praise them, you make them sound very faithful. <laughs> but actually, dogs are, you know, quite low in society, you know. You may, we, in modern times, of course, people give a lot of honor to dogs and they're very, they take a lot of care of them and so on. And if, if you mistreat the dogs, you can get in trouble. And you can even get fined and get in a lot of trouble if you don't take care of your dog. People care so much about dogs nowadays. But the dogs have a particular nature which is seen in human society. And Prabhupada compares it to, he talks about the begging mentality. The dog, you know, when, when, when you 
We, we see here in Mayapur, for example, in Mayapur, you know, there's a lot, quite a few stray dogs. And people often come to Mayapur and they will purchase prasadam and they may sit around and eat their prasadam and the dog will come. And the dog sees people, oh, they've got some food. The dog will come and the dog is sitting, he's very expert in begging to get some of the crumbs from the people, try to get some crumbs of some of the leftover food. So that begging mentality is there in the dog. And Prabhupada saw that also, he compares this to young people coming out of university. Yeah, at the time of graduation, you have to go and look for a job. And you have to go to, you know, you apply to different companies and you come to them and you, and you say, yes, you, if you give me a job, I will be a good dog. I will work for you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's actually the doggish mentality. Just like the, the dog needs a master. Every dog needs a master. So people coming out of university they have that doggish mentality and they go and they're looking for the job. And you know, most people coming out of university, they're looking for the job. They're not thinking about going to uh, starting their own business or working for themselves or anything. They come and look for a job and you apply to the different companies and, and you please, oh, please give me a job. I will be a good worker for you. I will work for you very nicely. That is the mood. <laughs> so this is the doggish mentality. Is it agreed? And you can see the resemblance, the materialistic civilization with the dogs? Yes, good Maharaj, perfect Maharaj. Okay, what about the pig or the hog? Who can tell us about the hog? Jamuna Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, always trying to satisfy their own senses. Really? Well, I think you can tell me a bit more. Can you give can you give more details about how, exactly what they do to satisfy their own senses? They're more into like uh, sex life and uh, eating uh, like waste. Yes. Who do they mate with? Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, what about their mating? Who do they mate with? Do they have a wife or what? No, they mate with anyone and everyone. Just to increase the number. Okay. So without any discrimination? Right. For their mating? So they don't have, yeah, they don't have uh, like a particular, like, wife or something they mate with, they mate with anybody just to satisfy their senses and uh, they eat anything nonsense, like all the waste. Yes, right. And if you, Prabhupada would often talk about the hog, he said, if you offer the hog some nice halava, what will he say? He won't take it. Why not? What does he want? He only wants the waste because he's so used to eating that waste that he doesn't enjoy, he doesn't relish the, the good food. And yeah, Prabhupada said the hog will say, just give me some nice stool. Let me have some stool. He doesn't want the nice halibut, he wants stool. And that's why the pigs become big and fat, because they eat stool. So the you know, these animals which eat stool, this is their condition. And so in the same way we have people of that category, 
working without mating and eating, without any discrimination. We'll eat anything and everything. Okay, and then we have the camel. What about the camels? What's their nature? Their specific nature which <laughs> is put into the Bhagavatam here by Prabhupada in his purports. Amrita Padma Mataji. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Camels, they relish uh, by eating their thorns. So, and uh, from that, even though the uh, blood is coming from the tongue also, they relish uh, their own blood. So, even uh, the thorns are compared to this materialistic uh, material world and uh, uh, people are uh, enjoying uh, the sex, sex life, like eating the thorns. Mm. Yes. Yes. That's right. People are working and sometimes even the big businessmen, they're engaging in their, their different activities. And they do all kinds of uh, sinful activities to make more money. Mm. And, and in this way they also eat the thorns of their own results of their work. They engage in yes. all kinds of sinful activities, so it's just like eating the thorns. And they have to taste their own blood. And so the, the foolish camel tastes its own blood and thinks, oh, it's very nice, it's very tasty. He doesn't realize his own tongue has been cut to pieces. So the same way people taste their own blood and their different nefarious activities, and they're thinking they're enjoying, but they're eating, they have to eat the thorny results of their activities. All right, and finally we have the ass, what about the, an ass? What is the nature of the ass? Why is a civilization like an ass? Kavirupa Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandar Pranam. Maharaj, uh, I understand that uh, like uh, ass is how it has been loaded. Um, uh, human beings are, we are also working very hard to maintain our life and uh, materialistic sense enjoyment. So basically it talks about that how human beings are behind working very hard 24 by 7 hours for the materialistic enjoyment and uh, for their own senses. Yes, so does the ass enjoy? No, because it's been overloaded with so much thing. It's working very hard and what's he getting as the result of all of his work? What's his reward? What does the ass eat? Dear junk. Hmm? The ass is given what to eat? Grass. Grass, right. And grass is growing everywhere. The grass is growing everywhere. And the ass is thinking, if I don't carry the load, I won't get any grass to eat. But the grass is growing everywhere. And the same way people are working in the factories and they're working in so many different places, day and night, just working to earn their livelihood, just for the sake of their little bit sense gratification. And what is the sense gratification of the ass? Srila Prabhupada describes, he said, the ass, the male, the male ass will approach the female ass and he will want to enjoy union with the female ass and the female ass has a habit to kick the male ass. That when the male approaches the female for mating, she will kick him and in this way the male suffers. And so this is like human society. Sometimes we see the man, he's working all day, working hard to earn the money, and at night the wife will kick. She'll complain and kick and give so many demands and make life full of problems for the man. 
unfortunate man. And the man, but the man is thinking, oh, this is his duty, this is his life. He has to do this. He has to accept this burden. So, some people, of course, they may object that, oh, this is not a very nice thing to say about modern society, that people are hogs, dogs, camels and asses. We may say, oh, come on, look at these people, you know, they're so well educated and they're, they're doing so much for the world, they've developed the world so nicely. We may say that, oh, no, they're good people, they're not really animals. What will you say? Well, Sukadeva Goswami gives us, uh, Rashona Karishi, he gives the example, he says, those people who are like hogs, dogs, camels and asses, they are praised by people who are like hogs, dogs, camels and asses. They praise, they praise those men who never listen to the glories of Krishna. So the, the big dog, the big hog, the big camel and ass, he is praised by the little dog and the little camel, little ass. <laughs> These people, big politicians, the big leaders, the statesmen and so on, they're all of the same kind of mentality, actually. They have the, the, the we, we can see these qualities in them. And the people who praise them, they're just smaller animals of the same nature. So the little dog praises the big dog, little pig praises the big pig. This is material civilization. Don't be bewildered by the whole thing. It's all ignorance. They're all in ignorance. Hmm. And Prabhupada calls them all, they're all rascals. And Prabhupada said, well, he said, it's a, it's a very hard word, very heavy word. But he said, it's true. It's true. They have no interest to hear about Krishna. They never want to listen to the pastimes of Lord Krishna. So they are simply rascals. In the words of the scriptures, they're simply rascals because they do not see any purpose in life other than sense gratification. So they're blind materialists. We don't want to be misled. Understand them for what they are. They're all rascals and they're on the levels of hogs, Dogs, camels, and asses. Would someone like to read here? Thanks, Guru Maharaj. One who has not listened to the messages about the prowess and marvelous acts of the personality of Godhead and has not sung or chanted loudly the worthy songs about the Lord is to be considered to possess yet ear holes like the holes of snakes and a tongue like the tongue of a frog. The upper portion of the body, though crowned with a silk turban, is only a heavy burden if not bowed down before the personality of Godhead, who can award mukti, freedom. And the hands, though decorated with glittering bangles, are like those of a dead man if not engaged in the service of the personality of Godhead, Hari. Loka number 20, 21. Thank you, Prabhu. So in this way, Sukadeva goes, uh, Shonaka Rishi rather, is going on to describe some of these, uh, the actions of their senses, of these people who don't hear the glories of the Lord. So first of all, is that those who don't listen to the messages of the Lord and is not sung or chanted loudly the worthy songs about the Lord, is to consider to possess ear holes like the holes of a snake. The holes of a snake. Actually, <laughs> who, 
Who makes the holes in the field? If you go in the field, the agricultural field, there are many holes. Who makes the holes? Snakes. Rats. Yes, rats and mice. They're the ones who make the holes. How do the snakes get there? By eating the rats. Yes. Yeah, the snakes come. And they eat the rat and they live in the hole. And sometimes also the frogs. There are people who don't chant the glories of the Lord but chant the, the mundane movie songs and the, the Gramya Kata, the village talk, then their tongues are like the tongue of a frog. Hmm? Kakakan, 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 kakakan. Right? The, flo the frog is chanting like that. When the, rainy com when the rainy season comes, then we'll hear the frogs all begin to croak, right? It's really a, quite a scene when the heavy rains come and the frogs all begin to croak and the, the snakes all come around. The snakes are eager and they're having a feast and they go around. Because the tongue of the frog, the frog is making his croaking sound and the snake of death is coming. Zap, zap. The snake comes and just eats the frogs. Sometimes they eat the mice and other times they eat the frog. So that is the food of the snakes. So they're compared to ear holes. The holes of the snake are compared to ear holes. Why? Anyone can say? Yes, Guru Maharaj, they cannot hear. Who? They can feel the vibration. Who cannot, who cannot hear? Snakes, Guru Maharaj. The snakes cannot hear. So how, why, is that, why are they compared to our ear holes? Because these materialistic people they cannot hear the uh, glories of the Lord. They are always attracted to mundane things. Yes. The ears, they fill with, if, if we don't hear the glories of the Lord, we are going to hear the glories of the material world. We will hear all the nonsense, all the mundane gossip of the material world. If we are not going to hear about Krishna, something else is going to enter the ear. The ear is not going to stay empty, something is going to come and you're going to hear all the things which are not Krishna conscious and our consciousness will become polluted, we'll forget Krishna. So that's the problem, just like the holes of the snake. The snake enters and the snake fills the hole with poison and the same way our ears become full with poison, the sound vibra mundane sound vibrations are just another poison causing us to forget Krishna. Right? And then the tongue, the croaking of the frog simply invites death to come, brings about our own death. And then the next example we're given about the upper portion of the body crowned with a silk turban is only a heavy burden if not bowed down before the personality of Godhead. If we have a, a, big, bur a big turban on our head, it may look very nice, but if you're drowning in the ocean or if you go to the Ganga wearing a heavy turban, you've got a turban on your head, then it will be very difficult to save yourself, you, you, you know, because you've got this heavy thing on your head. So you, you won't be able to get out from the ocean or from the heavy current of the water because of the weight on your head. You'll be pushed down into that ocean. 
So the person with the turban is more likely to drown than the person without the turban. It's simply a heavy burden on the head. So what should we do with the head? We're meant to bow down before the Lord. And if we don't bow down, then it's, a, it's not of no use. It's just simply a burden on our head. That head which will not bow before the Lord, then it's, it's just simply a burden. And similarly, his wife, the devotee's wife, may have, her hands may be decorated with different bangles, but these, bang, these hands are just like the hands of a dead person if they're not used in the service of the Lord. So we may de the lady may decorate her arms with nice bangles, but these hands are meant to be used for the service of the Lord. That is the point Shona Karishi is bringing out, that everything is meant for the service of Krishna. The ears for hearing, the tongue for chanting, the head for bowing down, the hands should be decorated for the service of the Lord. What about the legs? What are we meant to do with the legs? Anybody can say? With legs, we should visit the dham and temples. Yes. And temple, inside the temple, cleaning. Yes. Go to temple, go to visit the holy places, dance in the kirtan. <laughs> All of these things, we use the legs. Good. Oh. <laughs> okay, so we're up to ch uh, verse number 21. Let's see, go on to 22, the eyes, oh 22 describe about the eyes, the eyes which do not look at the symbolic representation of the personality of Godhead Vishnu, his forms, names, quality, etc. are like those printed on the plumes of a peacock. So the eyes, the, the, the eyes on the, the feathers of the peacock, the plumes of the peacock, they look very nice. But what is the use of them? They cannot see anything. They're just simply a colorful presentation. But they're, they're of no use. You cannot see anything with them. And similarly, if we don't use our eyes to go to see the deities, to go there to see the temple of the Lord and to see the form of the Lord, then our eyes are useless. And then the legs which don't move to the holy places, they're also considered to be like the trunks of a tree. Just like the trunks of a tree, they're stuck in the ground, they don't move. So the same way if our legs are not going to visit the holy places, then they're just like trunks of a tree. We're meant to use the legs to go to visit the holy places, to see the temples, to see the deities, for the service of the Lord. Then, text number 23. The person who has not at any time received the dust of the feet of the Lord's pure devotee upon his head, is certainly a dead body, and the person who has never experienced the aroma of the tosi leaves from the lotus feet of the Lord is also a dead body, although breathing. So Shonaka Rishi is describing here this about these non-devotees, these people who are very unfortunate persons never at any time received the dust of the feet of the Lord's pure devotee upon their head is certainly a dead body. Though we always hear about the importance of to take the dust from the feet of the pure devotees. Of course, it's not a very easy thing. And sometimes Prabhupada would give instruction, nobody should touch my feet. Sometimes Prabhupada was like that, he would say that 
nobody should touch my feet. He didn't want people coming, touching his feet. He would say, better you bring me my slippers. Rather than just touch his feet, he would say, better you bring me my slippers. So, that is how you get the mercy of the Lord. It's not just touching the feet. Who is actually qualified to touch the feet of the Lord? We can take the dust from the feet of the Lord without touching his feet. They, people used to come and they'd take the earth where Lord Chaitanya walked. They would dig up the dirt which Lord Chaitanya's feet had touched. And they would take the dust from the ground there where he walked. And this way there would be big holes along the road where Lord Chaitanya walked. So it's not that we have to come and touch the feet. We can take the dust of the feet without touching the feet themselves. And then we're told about the aroma of the tulsi leaves from the lotus feet of the Lord. We want to value also the, the tulsi leaves from the lotus feet. If we don't value that, then it's like a dead body. Even though we're breathing, we're just like a dead body. So we want to make proper use of the human life. It's very important to know how to properly use this human form of life in the service of the Lord. And then text 24 comes up, which is a very important verse. Uh, Okay, before we go on to 24, let me go back to the PowerPoint here, text number 20. The duty of a devotee. There are hundreds and thousands of sources for distributing mundane news of the world, and people of the world are also receiving it. Similarly, the people of the world should be taught to hear the transcendental topics of the Lord. And the devotee of the Lord must speak loudly so that they can hear. Prabhupada's, that's Prabhupada's purport of text number 20. So Prabhupada is making the point the devotees of the Lord must speak loudly so that they can hear. What does Prabhupada mean here when he says speak loudly? Does he just mean we have to shout? Would someone like to comment on this? Uh, Maharaj, um, what I feel is that Prabhupada is saying that get the message across. Preach what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is saying. Jare dekho tare kaho Krishna Upadesh. Yes, right. We want to reach the whole world, right? Of course, just by, you know, we may have an, an amplifier, good amplification system, but that's not going to get across the whole world. How are we going to get things across the whole world? That we have to have a nice propaganda system. So Prabhupada, of course, began this society, the ISKCON movement, for this in mind. This is very much in line with Prabhupada's mood and mission, that Prabhupada wanted to give this Krishna consciousness to the whole world. And he knew to do it, we have to have books in so many different languages, we have to have temples around the world and we have to have so many devotees traveling everywhere, preaching and giving classes and so on. So this is Prabhupada's mood and mission. Speak loudly. <laughs> Sometimes people don't like us for this. They say we, we make so much noise, we, we do everything in such a big way. And sometimes people feel, you know, they feel... Uh, put down or they think, you know, why we have to make everything so big and so on. They think it should just be simple, should just be small. But Prabhupada would say, I cannot think in a small way. Uh, one devotee was telling, he was telling uh, in the beginning of our movement, you know, Prabhupada had come to Vrindavan back from America and they were sitting in Vrindavan and, and uh, one devotee said to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, why don't we just have a a little center like what they have at Radha Damodar, 
why don't we just make a little place like that and we can have the deities and you know, we'll just have a little temple. But Prabhupada looked at him and said, I cannot think in a small way. He said, I have to do things big. He said, I want to do some, everything in a big way. He said, for the pleasure of my spiritual master. He said, I cannot think small. Because he knows, if you think small, then you get small results. You want to attract many people. But if you do things in a big way, you attract a lot of people. More people will be at attracted. Actually, next week there's a big program coming up in uh, uh, Patna. In Patna. In Patna, Bihar. They're opening a big temple there. His Holiness Jaipataka Swami Maharaj will be going there for the opening. It's a, they spent about 80 crores to build the temple there. It's huge, I heard. It's a very big temple. And so that way, you know, you build, a, you do something big, more people hear about it. You do it small, then, you know, a few people hear about it. But you want more people to hear, you have to do something big. So Prabhupada's mood and mission, he wanted to do big things. Think big. Hunt the rhinoceros, chasing rhinos, right? Shamsundar Prabhu wrote his book, Chasing Rhinoceros. Prabhupada taught him like that. All right? So we speak loudly so people can hear. The conclusion is, therefore, that one should be more serious about seeking the mercy of the devotee than that of the Lord directly. And by one's doing so, by the good will of the devotee, the natural attraction for the service of the Lord will be revived. More serious about seeking the mercy of the devotee than that of the Lord directly. So we should understand this point, this is another important point. Devotees are more merciful than Krishna. Can you imagine it? Devotees are more merciful than Krishna? Why is it so? Anyone can answer? In the nectar of devotion, it's just yes. Go ahead, Prabhu Mataji. Sorry. Uh, Maharaj, I wanted to say that uh, devotees normally give uh, a lot of mercy compared to even the Lord. Sometimes, uh, even those, even to those who are not deserving, they would give opportunity and give an option for them to practice bhakti. So, in that manner, they're more merciful. Yes. Can you give any examples from Scripture? Devotees being more merciful than the Lord? Um, um, I can think of the top of my head, Maharaj, uh, Narad Muni and Rigari. Yeah. He gave, even to a hunter, he, you know, was able to convert him to a devotee of the Lord who was, you know, okay. killing every single day. So, the devotee is even more massive. All right. Um, yeah, Nityanand Prabhu as well. Yes. To Jagai and Madai. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's what I can think of. Okay, thank you Prabhu. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Go ahead. Ambrish. What? What about him? More merciful than the Lord. Why? What did he do? Even though uh, he was affected, he was so merciful and he. Uh, He, he didn't mind the offense of the uh, sage. 
Ambarish didn't take offence against their Vasamuni, but the Lord took offence. Okay? We have the example also, Lord Chaitanya had one servant, and the servant brought him some trouble. Lord Chaitanya had to rescue him. He'd gone off with some tribal people, and Lord Chaitanya had to save him and bring him back. So he brought him back to Jagannath Puri, and then he told the devotees, he said, I, can't take, I cannot take the servant with me anymore. He was trouble for me, I had to rescue him. And so Lord Chaitanya rejected him from his service. But the other devotees, they sent him to Navadweep and told him, you go to Navadweep and serve Mother Sachi there. So it's Kala Krishna Das, Lord Chaitanya's servant, and he was sent to Navadweep by the mercy of the devotees. So Prabhupada points out there, the mercy of the devotees is greater than the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya had rejected him from his service, but the devotees engaged him in service. They gave him another service. So Krishna rarely gives his mercy because Krishna becomes controlled and purchased by his devotees. And Prabhupada describes Krishna became the chariot driver of Arjuna and he became a messenger for Maharaj Yudhisthira. So Krishna is very reluctant to give the mercy directly himself, but the devotees are more merciful. And the devotees, Krishna likes to give the credit to his devotees. And Prabhupada talks about how in Vrindavan everyone wants the mercy of Srimati Radharani. And if Srimati Radharani will recommend the devotee, then certainly Krishna will accept them. So to get the mercy of the devotee is very, very important. Where do we get bhakti from? We get bhakti from the person who has bhakti. And the personification of bhakti, we have Srimati Radharani, and we have also the pure devotees. The pure devotees, they carry the Lord in their heart. And they have bhakti. And they give bhakti. Jad Bharat was asked by Maharaj Rahugana, where did you get this bhakti? Where did you get all this knowledge from? And what did Jad Bharat say? Yes? Where did Jad, what did Jad Bharat say when he was asked by Maharaj Rahugan where you got all this from? Yes? Somebody must know. From the dust of the lotus feet of the Lord. Yes. Lotus feet of the, uh, I mean, from the dust of the devotees of the Lord. Yes, you have to, take, of the you have of the to take the dust from the feet of the devotees and smear it all over your body. And then we see the same thing was asked by Lord Nasringadev to Prahlad Maharaj. Where did you get all of this devotion from Prahlad? Where did you get it from Prahlad? And what did Prahlad say? Same, Maharaj, from the dust of the lotus feet of the Yes, the Devotees only of way you get it is you have to get the dust from the feet of the devotees. The mercy of the devotee. And how do you get that mercy of the devotee? It's not just touch the dust, take the dust from the... But engage in the service Wait, of the devotees, sorry. right? The service of the devotee. So that is how we actually get attraction for Krishna. Krishna is pleased when he sees us honour the devotees. Krishna, he who says he is my devotee, he is not my devotee. But if he is a devotee of my devotee, then he is my devotee. So we want to get the mercy of Krishna, we have to approach his devotees. How can you enhance appreciation of Prabhupada's mood and mission in your temple or community? We can take contributions. How would we enhance appreciation of Prabhupada's mood and mission in our temple? What do you need to do? Go 
Don't all speak at once. Yes? Uh, by following Prabhupada's instructions, what he has asked us, what he has told us to do, we carry that same message, we pre preach as it is what he has told us to do. And that way we appreciate his mood and mission. Oh, uh, I don't know. Prabhupada told us to do so many things. I don't know what you want us. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, Prabhupada, he said, like, uh, now you said, uh, like, uh, think big, make everything big. So, like, uh, constructing big temples, attracting uh, more people, so that uh, they will uh, hear, see uh, Krishna, and uh, they will come in association with the uh, devotees. Well, we, we want to be cautious about that. We get too much into just developing temples. And we, we just think only, oh, money, 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 we have to get money to build the temple and we forget all about the preaching. And we, we don't take care of the community. We're only thinking build the temple. And so Prabhupada never worried about money. He never worried, you yeah, know, okay, build a temple, it's all right. But the important thing is we want to have an appreciation for Prabhupada's mood and mission. The big temple will come about if we can encourage people to become more inspired by Prabhupada's mood and mission. So one thing we have to do is read Prabhupada's books regularly, studying Prabhupada's books regularly, and hearing about Prabhupada's life, and hearing Prabhupada's lectures also, and then hearing Prabhupada's kirtan. We have so many nice kirtaniers, we want, need to also hear Prabhupada's kirtan, and we need to hear Prabhupada's lectures. And we need to read about Prabhupada. Different devotees have written nice books. Giri Swami recently brought out his book, Let There Be a Temple, and about the Juhu Temple, very big book. He spent so many years writing it. And we have so many nice books about Prabhupada now. Many devotees have written, so try to read them. All of these things will help us to increase our appreciation for Prabhupada's mood and mission. All right? Now this, this verse here, this number 24, the effect of Nam Aparad. This is a, a, an important verse. Certainly that heart is still framed which in spite of one's chanting the holy name of the Lord with concentration does not change when ecstasy takes place. Tears fill the eyes and the hairs stand on end. All right, try to understand this verse. It's not so easy to immediately understand. We have to hear about it for a few times. Anyway, uh, Shonakarishi is describing, he was describing different people who didn't like to chant. So we may be feeling good, oh, I'm okay, I'm all right. Now, this is the one which really puts us in our place, this final thing, because probably we're all in this category, we're all still, heart, still framed, our hearts just, I don't know about yours, but I know my heart must be still framed because I'm chanting the holy name and I'm trying to concentrate, but my heart has not changed. Of course, I haven't even come to the ecstasy. You know, it said ecstasy, when, when ecstasy takes place, tears fill the eyes and hairs stand on end. So those are the external symptoms. But Sonakarishi is concerned that the internal symptoms haven't come. The heart is still still framed. Even though the ecstasy has come there externally, the heart has not changed. The heart is in a still frame. You know, it's not going to melt. It's not going to change. So this is the point. And the, the problem is nam aparat, the effect of nam aparat. So, 
we invite you now, you can read and discuss Srila Prabhupada's purport. How many people are here tonight? How many people? We are 37, Maharaj. Oh my goodness, 37. Okay, anyway, you can make um, six people in a group, six, six, six groups. Put six people in a group and everybody can read together and discuss Srila Prabhupada's purport. And we want to hear about the change in heart. Sure, Marge. I'll be just up five minutes, so. <laughs> okay, okay, Maraj. So I'm creating six groups, Maraj. Yes, thank you. Recording in progress. Ramras Prabhu, can I put you in some room? I ball.
Maharaj, everybody is back, Maharaj. Oh, everyone back? Oh, good, good. Thank you, Prabhu. All right, so now we're hearing about this, this important verse, the, the, the heart. Srila Prabhupada's purport. Here's a little quote first from Prabhupada. The mature stage of Vishnu worship is suggested herein in relation to the change of heart. The whole process of spiritual culture is aimed at changing the heart of the living being in the matter of his eternal relation with the Supreme Lord, his subordinate servant, which is, is which is his eternal constitutional position. It is expected by all means that by discharging regulated devotional service, one must manifest the change of heart. To what extent have we experienced a change of heart as a result of studying Srimad Bhagavatam? So, just maybe based on what you've discussed in your bigger groups tonight, where you were six people, have, 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 we, have we actually experienced any change of heart? The change of heart being the internal aspect, not the externally, you know, we heard about the tears and the sta hair standing on end and uh, quivering of the body, but the change of heart is the, the internal change. And these are the these are the symptoms which are described in the section on Bhava Bhakti. I think there's uh, ten different qualities of one who's on the level of Bhava Bhakti, beginning with steadfastness and then eagerness to chant the holy name, eagerness to live in the holy place, he has a very strong hope to achieve perfection, things like that. There are ten different symptoms of someone on the level of Bhava Bhakti. So these are the kind of change of heart which we would like to experience. So to what extent have we experienced that change as a result of studying Srimad Bhagavatam? It's, it's an ongoing course, of course, it's something you could say we, we never graduate. We have to keep studying. We have to keep going on and on, studying more and more to bring about the change in heart. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur has an interesting purport on this verse and he talks about the different symptoms of bhava which are the, which is actually the change in heart. So Sonika Rishi is pointing out that even though one may manifest the symptoms externally, the actual internal symptoms may not be there. The internal symptom, the real change in the heart which is seen in that intense eagerness to absorb oneself in studying Srimad Bhagavatam. Would anyone like to comment on this? Have you, has anybody had the opportunity to actually experience a change in heart studying Srimad Bhagavatam? Can you feel some changes in yourself? Jamuna Mataji, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, while we are reading the Bhagavatam, we feel that there is a change in the heart. But the moment we close, uh, we get engrossed in the material activities, again, it we get back to the normal position. So yes, while reading or while associating, we feel the change. But because we still have a long way to go, 
to get ourselves purified, the change is not permanent yet. It is still taking a long time. But as long as we are associated with the Bhagavatam book or Bhagavat the, as a uh, as a Bhagavata, as an as a devotee, yes, we feel the change at that particular moment of the time. Yes, it's very nice realization. Thank you, Mataji. I agree with you that it takes time. We have to appreciate that we've been in the material world a long time. We're conditioned souls. And so we have a lot of conditioning to remove. And it takes time for us to remove that conditioning. But certainly we have the very powerful process, studying Srimad Bhagavatam and absorbing our mind and thinking about Srimad Bhagavatam, certainly helps to bring about that change. Yes. Anybody else like to contribute anything on this matter? Amrita, Amrita Patnal Mataji. Hare Krishna Mahalas. Yes, Maharaj, like uh, uh, when we are uh, reading Bhagavatam, studying Bhagavatam every day, like we feel uh, some courage is there inside within us or some power is there within us to uh, overcome any kind of problems, any kind of material problems, all to sustain or withstand within us and uh, keep Krishna in center and do it. So that uh, some strength will be there and we will not be uh, worried for all these uh, kind of material problems. That's uh, one thing I have felt and, uh, and we will be having kind of happiness inside. We will be satisfied. We will not have uh, will not have the um, habit of uh, answering the material happiness. If it comes, okay. If it doesn't, um, that kind of. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Madhiji. Yes, it's helping us to face all the problems and difficulties in life, giving us strength. To. to Krishna Maharaj, uh, what I feel, um, I feel that by, by listening, by hearing and by reading and attending this class, I am able to identify my drawbacks and my faults um, that, oh, I am so far from this. I, I, I have this problem. I need to work on this. I'm, I'm, I'm lacking in this. So I think it's, it's very, very important to know where you are. To, to identify your problems and to strive and pray to Lord and to serve the devotees so that we get the mercy and we can uh, get a little of that, um, a little of the standards which are being mentioned here by Prabhupada. Oh, thank you. Very nice, very nice realization. It helps us to understand more our condition our conditioning and where we're lacking and how much more effort we require to put into this process in order to actually succeed. We have to really endeavor. Yes, very good. All right, so let's just look over some of the point, what we covered, the main points in this lesson tonight. We explained the connection between the second and the third chapter. Right? The first chapter was telling us to meditate on the Virata Rup, and then the second chapter was directing us to meditation on the Super Soul. And then the third chapter was telling us that actually what we should do, we should worship the Supreme Lord. That was the real point. If, you, if, if the Vedas say if you have material desires, you can worship the demigods, but Shukadeva Goswami said you have material desires, whatever, worship the Supreme Lord if you have the proper intelligence. And uh, so the, the third chapter is emphasizing devotional service, even though you may have material desires we can take up devotional service. So the overview of chapter 3, it began with the recommendation to worship different demigods. The Vedas prescribe the worship of different demigods to satisfy material desires. And then Sukadeva Goswami directs us to devotional service 
even if we have material desires. And then Shonaka Rishi glorifies the process of Krishna Kata. And he condemns those who don't hear. And he describes all the faults of the different limbs which don't engage in the service of Krishna. Then the difference between Nitya Siddha and Sadhana Siddha. Who remembers? What's the difference? Nitya Siddha are Mahatma and they are always uh, pure devotees. They are pure devotees. Sadhana Siddha are uh, those who are uh, practicing devotees and the uh, Matthi the, the Pupa Siddhas are the one who get the from the Well, the Nitya Siddhas are the ones who never forget Krishna. And, and the Sadhana Siddhas are the ones who have forgotten Krishna. Right? Yes, right. So the Nitya Siddhas, the, from birth they're always Krishna conscious. And the Sadhana Siddhas, they're becoming Krishna conscious. And then Udharadi, the broader outlook, all should worship Krishna in relation to demigod worship and materialism in general. If people are broader outlook, everyone should worship Krishna. With demigod worship, people may worship demigods. That is not broader intelligence. What we should do is worship Krishna. And even people are materialistic. They have all material desires. They want liberation. Okay, they're materialistic. Still they can worship Krishna. Everyone can worship Krishna. And Krishna will help. Krishna may satisfy their desires. Or he may take away their desires, he may purify them. And then we have the Ayur Harati Vaipumsam, that verse, how the sun fails to rob the pure devotees of his duration of life. As the sun passes from east to west, reduces the duration of life, except for those who are engaged in chanting the glories of the Lord. Because those who chant the glories of the Lord, they're going to go on to the spiritual world, to eternal life, to continue to chant in the spiritual world. And then the analogies in this section, Sonaka Rishi's analysis of one who neglects devotional practices. There were many different analogies, right? He compared people who never hear the glories of the Lord. They were compared to animals like hogs, dogs, camels and asses. And they praise other people who are bigger hogs, dogs, camels and asses. They don't praise the Supreme Lord. They praise people of their similar nature. So that example was given. And so Nukarishi also spoke about the head which has a big turban on his head, just a heavy burden, if it doesn't bow down before the Lord. And the eyes which don't look on the deity, they're compared to what? Plums of a peacock. The eyes on the plumes of the peacock, yes. And the, 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 the tongue which doesn't chant the holy name of the Lord, then what's it doing? Looking like a frog. Yeah. It's compared yeah. to frog. Yeah. And the ears? Snake holes. The ears snake. Oh, yeah. Like holes. snakes. The snakes enter into the ears, right? Into the holes. Okay. And then the hands, which don't, which are, they have nice bangles on, but they don't serve the Lord. The hands of the dead body. Yes, dead body. And then the, the, the head which never took the dust from the feet of the pure devotees. It's a burden for the person. The, 
the, if the head never took the dust, then what's his position? Dead body. Also like a dead body, yeah. Hmm. Doesn't, never took, and he never smelt the aroma of the tulsi leaves from the lotus feet of the Lord? It's also like a dead body. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that person who, in spite of shedding tears and quivering of the body, hair standing on end, but the heart doesn't change when he chants the holy name, then? Still framed. Still framed. Still framed. Still framed. His heart is still heart framed. framed. Right. So discuss Srimad Bhagavad description of society in terms of hogs, dogs, camels and asses, yes personal application, be more serious about seeking the mercy of the devotee than that of the Lord directly. Don't think you can go to Krishna directly. We have to get the mercy of the devotees. So serve the devotees. That's very important. Serve the pure devotees. By serving Srila Prabhupada's mission, you're also getting the mercy of the devotees. And then the change of heart can actually happen in our life. How can it happen in our life? We can just go on, increase our hearing and chanting, and become more absorbed in this, and the heart will change. And Prabhupada's mood and mission, this statement, the people of the world should be taught to hear the transcendental topics of the Lord and the devotees of the Lord must speak loudly so that they can hear. So the propaganda program around the world, everywhere, we make propaganda programs, we're, we're propagandists, we're interested in making propaganda for the message of Krishna, to promote Krishna. Krishna Consciousness, let everyone hear the Holy Name, let everyone taste prasadam, let the books go everywhere. This is Srila Prabhupada's desire, this is the mooted mission, Srila Prabhupada, to give everyone the mercy of Krishna Consciousness. All right, are there any questions? Anyone? Hare Krishna Maharaj. I have a question. Maharaj, you said that uh, uh, if someone with material desires approaches Krishna in that verse, Akama Sarvuka Mova, and Krishna may or may not fulfill his desire. So, a person who has certain desires to be fulfilled and he sees that Krishna is not fulfilling and he goes away and then engages in uh, demigod worship. So how is that then beneficial for that soul? Well, the point is that somebody comes to Krishna consciousness and worships Krishna. Okay, he comes to Krishna consciousness with material desires and Krishna doesn't fulfill the material desire, then he should understand it's not actually good for him that Krishna thinks it's not necessary, it's not really what, what's required for the welfare of that person. So one should have that faith in Krishna. Now if he goes away to worship demigods, that means somehow he, he didn't have faith. He was not a faithful devotee, he was not chased to the worship of Krishna. And he's going off to worship some other god to get what he wants. That is not very intelligent. That is not the broader intelligence which is required to take up the worship of Krishna. We have to have that faith and that, in, in that fixed intelligence that Krishna knows what is right. And if Krishna wants, he can give it. If he doesn't give it, it's something that means it's not right. We don't need it. Yes, Maharaj. But as a devotee or as a practicing devotee, we can have that understanding. 
but uh, someone who is not a devotee just wants some you know benefit from krishna material benefit so that person obviously will lack faith if his desire is not fulfilled well yes the point is that his faith is based on that just fulfilling his own desire it's not we have to understand that there's we have to there has to be that willingness to submit to krishna if he's not sub surrendering to krishna then he's not really qualified to have that reciprocation with krishna it just simply wants his own way that's not that's not how it is he's going to learn the hard way you know he may go and worship some other god and the, some other god may fulfill his desire but then in the end ultimately he's going to suffer he's going to have difficulties he's going to have problems and he, ultimately he will end up regretting that he'd gone away from krishna he couldn't surrender to krishna's plan so we yes. say man proposes and god disposes and so we may propose but if god doesn't dispose we should accept that it's not good for us it's not right we cannot dictate no i have to have it if i can't have it i'm going away oh what kind of devotion is that there's no devotion there at all it's, yes, it's very materialistic to approach like that so one may have all material desires is one thing but you have to have that proper intelligence to uh, to admit to accept the authority of krishna Uh, but of course he, you can always say well you didn't wait long enough that's also there that you know he decided that oh, i've tried long enough i didn't get what i want i'm going to worship some other god you could always say well why don't you you have to wait you have to give krishna more time and show krishna that this is really what you want and you don't want anything else and so you really want that you know if you, then you if you wait long enough then krishna may fulfill the desire but if, if he becomes impatient and goes away <laughs> what can what can you do what can be done hmm? all right maharaj here we can also say that that is uh, that is the difference between worshiping going with material desires to krishna and going with material desires to the demigod because they would just fulfill your desire but krishna will take out that desire from your heart and he will instead attract you to him so that's the difference and then it depends on the devote devotee right how he is using his free will whether he really wants to uh, you know surrender to krishna or he still has those desires right maharaj yes sometimes krishna may want to take out the desire but we don't want the desire to come out we want to keep that desire there they're not willing to give up not willing to change that desire so just like prabhupada gives the example the son wants to smoke and the father says no don't smoke don't smoke but eventually you know the son you know what can be done the son grows up he's a grown man the father can't stop the son and the son goes out to smoke the father tried but ultimately they have to give some independence so krishna can, he can fulfill the desires of everyone but he will he will first of all try he will want to first of all take away these desires we come with material desires and krishna knows these desires are not good for us they're just going to be a problem so krishna tries to correct us and purify our consciousness and get us to give up these attachments but if we're very attached then krishna okay then krishna may arrange it it just takes more time 
Maharaj, uh, I wanted to say something about what we discussed about the devotee being more merciful than Krishna. Ah. We can also uh, we can also give example of Lord Chaitanya himself because Lord Chaitanya comes as a devotee and he is Mahavadanyaya. He is even more merciful than Krishna. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so. he comes as a devotee, he is Mahavadanyaya, he is giving Krishna to everyone. Yes, nice. <laughs> Maharaj, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, in the Bhagavad Gita they say, you know, the Krishna is a devotee of his devotees. Oh, yes. Krishna is a devotee and they complement each other like the diamond and the gold in the ring. Yes. The devotees are serving Krishna and Krishna wants to serve the devotees. Devotees. Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj, in that way. Krishna is also more merciful, no Maharaj, because he is glorifying his devotees. He is not taking credit for himself, right? Yeah. In that way, Lord is himself is so merciful, right, Maharaj? Yes. Can we say like that? Yes. Why not? Yes. yes Krishna Maharaj. is more merciful. Yeah. More, yeah. Wants to glorify his devotees. He's distributing his mercy through his devotees. Give the credit. It's transcendental competition. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. That's a wonderful class, Maharaj. Thank you for that. Uh, wonderful class, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then we will stop here tonight. Jai Govinda Prabhu. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Jamuna Mati Ji, uh, you have raised uh, your, uh, your hands. Do you have any question? Uh, oh, no, Prabhu. Actually, I... Uh, actually, I was just saying the same point about purifying the desires and the heart. The same point. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Okay. Thank for you. For you, it's already nine. I mean, it's already ten o'clock for you, Maharaj. So we don't want to hold you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Hare Krishna. So we will meet you on last class. Next next class, we'll meet you, Maharaj, on Tuesday. Okay. Srila Prabhupada yeah. ki. Yeah. His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinashik Narasimha Swami Maharaj Ki Jai Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Ki Jai <laughs>